firstly, um, my name is Gabby, and on behalf of LSAT Unplugged, I am so excited to welcome Dean Andrew Kornblatt, who is the current Dean of Admissions at Georgetown Law and Associate Vice President for the Graduate Enrollment um, at Georgetown University. He is a graduate of Harvard University and Boston College School of Law and has been a member of Georgetown of the Georgetown community since 1980. So um, thank you, Dean Andrew Kornblatt, for Am I the only one who just lost Gabby? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. You froze for a sec. You froze for a sec. My apologies. I was just going to give you the floor to introduce yourself. So please. Okay. I guess I'll just introduce myself. Um, <clears throat> so I am Andy Kornblatt, and I am lucky enough to be the Dean of Admissions at Georgetown Law School. I've been there for about two centuries and have loved pretty much every single day um, I've been there. Um, it's amazing when you stay at a place that long to watch the arc of things, um, where what the school was like, what admissions was like back in the 17th century. And then when you can come forward now and in the middle of COVID, it's just, it's been a remarkable run. And this year in particular has been quite amazing. I'm sure we'll get to that um, and talk about that and all the things that that's meant for us. But. I've loved every second at Georgetown. I think it's a wonderful, exciting place to be. And I'm just happy to be here. And thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you. Um, and before we begin, I just want to make it clear to all the students who are listening and online with us, if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to put them into the chat. And I will do my best uh, to make sure that they're addressed throughout this conversation. Um, so, Dean Andrew Kornblatt, would you mind, uh, you mentioned, you know, how special Georgetown has been in your personal experience, but I just wanted to kick it off and give you the floor to tell us what makes Georgetown Law such a special place for students to pursue their legal education um, at. I, I'd be happy to, as long as you stop calling me Andrew. Andy would be better, thanks. Andy's okay. just fine. And no Andrew's worries. one of my parents used to call me when I did something wrong. So I still have this <laughs> reflex. So Andy would be better, thanks. Okay. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, thanks, Gabby. Um, and welcome everybody. I should have said that at the beginning. Thanks so much for coming in and, and listening in. I'm delighted to spend some time with you. Um, look, I think each law school has its own personality and has its own strengths and weaknesses at Georgetown. Uh, Georgetown is a large law school as law schools go compared to your undergraduate school is less, but compared to other law schools, it's large. Um, but we have worked extremely hard over the last 10, 12, 15 years to make it feel small. And so it, we have smaller sections, people really care about each other in the community. Um, and I think that's all wonderful, but not but. And what makes, um, the place so exciting is just the proximity to everything in Washington, D.C., sort of the heartbeat of everything. So if you want to see how the law is made, walk over to Congress. You want to see how the law is interpreted, walk over to the Supreme Court. You want to see how the law is implemented, go over to some of the agencies or the, or the courts or everything. It's just all within walking distance. Academically, what that means for students is that they get to observe firsthand and again, can watch, walk over and see arguments at the Supreme Court, just have access to the Hill and just all the, the things that are going on in Washington. And that part's pretty terrific. But in addition, within the curriculum, within the curriculum now, that you can do on your own, but within the curriculum, uh, Georgetown has terrific clinical programs. Clinical programs are things that go on in years two and three, where you get to represent clients and some of them. Georgetown has what's most would consider the best in the country, certainly the largest. It's a great opportunity for you to be a lawyer, except as a law student. Very exciting, students love doing that. This experiential learning is just all these different courses. Don't get me started on this or I'll use up all my time talking about that. You guys wanna hear about admissions. It's a wonderful, exciting, electric place where lots goes on all the time. No, that's that's wonderful. And I think, you know, one thing that I'd like, uh, I'm sure other students are curious about is in your perspective, um, you know, Georgetown has all these really specialized programs. I know I've seen uh, numerous amounts of the experiential learning opportunities that you're uh, mentioning and the specific areas of study. But from your perspective, um, what are some of the specific things that really makes Georgetown feel like a small community? 
The classes are divided into smaller sections. So there'll be no class that you'll take with more than 70 students. We just have created more sections. So that part's very exciting and we sort of reduced all of that. But the big thing is sort of all of the counseling aspects we have, the student life office is well populated. We in the admissions office, we're, well, I'm sure we'll get to that, how personalized the admissions process is, or at least I hope students feel that way. And in addition to that, when you're taking these courses, because there are so many courses to take, most of your upper level classes will have 20 people, 25 people, 15 people. Some, the big ones will have 100 people, but most of them are much smaller. They're seminars. It's just everyone there. This is led by Dean Trainer, our dean, who's a student dean, and who's made it clear to us, we want this to be a large school with a small school feel. And I think that's exactly what each of us who work there wake up every day, making sure we have, we let the students feel. Oh, that's wonderful. And I'm sure that the conversation will certainly flow back to those areas. Um, as I've noticed, some of the students in the chat seem to be interested in some of those specific areas of law that you mentioned. Um, but just getting back to an admissions perspective, um, what we'll start, we'll start general. So what general advice do you have from students for students applying straight from uh, their undergraduate degrees from law schools? And does this advice differ for applicants who um, maybe have been in the workforce for a few years and are looking to apply to law school, um, you know, five years, three years, what have you from finishing their undergraduate degrees? The advice is still pretty much the same. I mean, obviously, people who have been out in the world will have more, probably have more on their resume, will have more of life experience. And that's all well and good, and that's terrific. But people coming straight out, you guys have had plenty of experience too. It's just been during the summers and while you're in school. I don't have different advice. I guess um, for the college seniors who are applying now, um, it's, it's going to be on you all to sort of flesh out who you are um, a little bit more in the essays that you write. We'll get to that, I'm sure. In the essays that you write, in your resume, any addenda you want to add to the application, just so we can get the three-dimensional feel for you. Students who've been out in the world, they've been working, um, they have different aspects to their resume that 20, you know, seniors in college don't have as much. So that, they, that can sort of speak for itself a little bit. But if you're in senior in college, you've done a million things. I see so many spectacular kids, both in, you know, seniors and out. Um, just every aspect of admissions at Georgetown is just has comes down to one thing. Tell me who the heck you are. And don't just tell me, show me. Tell me and show me who the heck you are. This matters to me, it matters to us. And it's on you, the applicants, to sort of put forward your very best person. I wanna learn about you, I wanna get to know you. It's a real hard thing to do in two pages, double spaced in a personal statement, all that's really hard, but that's the goal here. And that's no different if you're a college senior, or if you've been out of school for a while. It's all the same. I mean, it's, the, the goal is still the same. What I'm looking for is still the same. College seniors just have a tiny bit more um, sort of challenge to them to sort of flesh their experience out because they don't have the work world that people have been out 10, you know, five, 10, 15 years have. Sure, yeah, and that's really interesting. And, um, you know, for a, a, for a personal question, do, do you feel as if, um, you know, students who are, are very strong applicants may be more appealing if they reflect themselves through their experiences or do a really, you know, diligent job at trying to portray who they are through that through certain experiences. I think every single student who applies to Georgetown Law School benefits by doing what you just said, Gabby, every single one. Let me know who you are. Do that in ways that you want to do. Now, one of at Georgetown we have uh, optional questions. We have five optional questions. Tell us your top 10 list, those kind, they change every year. That's another example of where if you do it, it'll flesh out a little bit, just the human side of you. Look, we get so many applications. Again, we'll get to this too. Georgetown gets the most applications of any law school in the country. And I'm reading so many files. Good Lord, you think, you, I mean, here comes some more, here comes some more, here comes some more. And oh, look, here comes some more, these daily tsunamis of, of applications are coming in to differentiate for, to, for me to read a file and say, huh, well, that's interesting. That's someone, that's what you're trying to do. You have great numbers that makes you interesting in one aspect, 
but we have lots of those folks too. No matter what numbers you have, get really interesting. Get us and me to say, this is someone I want at Georgetown. And you're getting in, full stop. You're getting in. Maybe that doesn't predict because it's so much more than numbers for us. So um, how you present yourself and sort of how you come across and how I get to know you is not just lip service. It's easy to say. It's another thing to actually commit to do. And we commit to do it. Thank you. No, and you know, another thing that I know a lot of students struggle with is, is they've got all these experiences that they're really passionate about, um, you know, work-wise or volunteer-wise, but they're not necessarily sure how to integrate the personal characteristics or attributes that they feel really identify themselves, uh, that they identify themselves by, excuse me. So for those students um, who are really passionate about their extracurricular experience, whatever it may be, what advice would you give to an applicant to help them understand whether their personal statement um, is personal enough? Um, well, there's so much, so many aspects to every single human. That's what makes us human. So there's all kinds of things you want, applicants want us to know. My, my suggestion is to let the personal statement, that essay, be sort of the center part. Let that be my chance to begin to really get to know you. So if that's on whatever subject you want, again, I'll go through this a little bit later, whatever subject you want, it's all good with me. But just always remember whatever you are presenting me with, that's going to help me get to know you. We're not going to have the opportunity to hang out for a week. I'm not going to see, or even for an hour. I'm not going to have the time to just get to know you over time. Be nice, I'm sure. But we've got 14,000 applicants. There are enough hours in the day. So your essay frames it, lets me know you are. But, but we created addenda to the file for anything additional any applicant wants to share with us. Sometimes that's playing offense. Sometimes it's playing defense. So for example, if a student has a particularly high LSAT, and the GPA is a little bit on the low side, but they were sick or something happened or something happened to the family, that may or may not come out in the wash anyway. It's on the applicant to make sure that they let us know. Now, how to do that? If that integrates into your personal statement in a nice, smooth way, beautiful, go do that. But if it doesn't, if what you want to write your essay about is why you want to go to law school or whatever, I don't know, whatever it is, why you want to go to Georgetown Law School, whatever it is, if it's not covering information you want me to know, send in an addenda. These are welcome. These are encouraged. These, you guys are paying a fortune to apply to law school, for goodness sakes. You get to do it any way you want. So send additional stuff. I mean, don't just send it to send it. But if it's important, if it matters, if it will help me get a better sort of view of you and get to know you better, do it. There's lots of information you have to give me. We're all complicated. Let me know. And that's on the applicant. I am happy. We have no limit on this. You know, don't just send it to send it, as I say. But whatever you want me to know, that's what I want to know about you. Now, and we'll certainly touch on addendums. And, uh, you know, Georgetown offers the opportunity to write an optional statement and diversity statements. Um, but I suppose just on a personal note, you know, let's say a student's interested are really passionate in a specific area of study. Let's say it's health law, because Georgetown has one of the leading health law programs in the country. Um, you know, to what extent should the applicant convey that interest through their personal statement if they are more concerned with, you know, just making sure that they've articulated all their meaningful experiences throughout their undergrad in two pages? Remember now we're getting a resume. We also have that. So to simply re- state that is, is not a good use of your time or space or my time, frankly. But if, if let's use your example, Gabby, health law is something the student is passionate about, has a little experience in, can't wait to start. That's why they're applying to Georgetown. Bingo. That's what your personal statement's about. This is what the applicant wants me to know about that, about that, about herself or himself. So let us know, you know, the, find an elegant way to say, I want to go to law school because I want to study health law. And I want to go to Georgetown Law School because you're so great in it. Here's what I've done. Here's what I'm going to do. And, you know, I can't imagine a better fit. That's a beautiful essay. Now, it's all in how you write it. It's all in how sort of well it's framed and how tight it is and how interesting it is. But 
if there's a particular interest, health law, international law, public service, human rights, criminal justice, you know, the list goes, environmental law, the list goes on and on and on. If that's sort of how you want to, not to find yourself, but to sort of highlight about yourself, that's on you, go do it. But if, if for example, there's a family thing or a story you want to tell us and, and, this, and the essay flows with that, but they, you didn't quite get to that criminal justice piece. And that's important too. That's where I'm talking about the addenda. But if you can synthesize it, so it's all in the personal statement, terrific. It matters, it matters. I mean, whoever's listening and whoever will listen, trust me when I tell you, what you write in this personal statement can make a difference between whether you get in or you don't get in, period, end of sentence. So don't be fooled into think this is only numbers. I'm only gonna talk for Georgetown, this is only numbers. Uh-uh, it's more interesting and more fair than that and more open than that. Thank you for that. And, you know, um, as we segue towards the optional statements and talking about the diversity statements, um, for you, what does a balanced portfolio of a diversity statement, an optional statement, a personal statement for students who, you know, choose to write the optional pieces look like? Uh, it depends on the student. I, it, let me just, if I can, let me highlight one word, if I can, that, that is so important to me and to us in everything anybody does. And that word is authentic. Be authentic in this, be genuine, be authentic. So if, you know, for each of the, for each of the pieces of the application that you're talking about, the addenda, the, the personal statement, et cetera, I want to learn about you and I want to learn something real about you. So in the diversity statement, if there are aspects of your life and you that you think fit this, that this is something not everybody comes down the same path. We all come from different places and we all want to go to different places. And you want me to know about how you got here or you want me to know where you're going. And that and incorporated in that is sort of your background and sort of who make, what makes you, you. That's a perfect candidate for the diversity statement to give me that extra light. I'm just looking for light. Give me that extra light into you. Again, we're not gonna hang out. I'm not gonna have enough time to really get to know you. So you've gotta shine the light where you want me to see it. So it's each of these elements collectively gives me a sense of who you are. What I say to students when they write their personal statement, and this would probably go for adding in addenda and diversity statements. If, when you're done with this, you can give it to somebody else and ask them, if you've never met me before, do you know me a little better now? And if the answer to that is yes, you're on the right track. If the answer to that isn't yes, if you're keeping arms length, if you're just trying to sort of you know, get just this, yeah, just gonna turn the faucet on just enough. So I, that's, that you can do that, but more often than not, the most successful applicants are the ones who are open and unafraid in how they present themselves. So that's what I would highlight, authentic, open, unafraid. That's how I get to know you. And that's, that's on the applicant to try and open it up as much as they can so I can learn about them. No, and I, I, I love that word authenticity that you've used. Um, and, you know, through speaking, one of the things that personally comes to mind is vulnerability when you, you know, ask students to be open and honest um, and unafraid. So perhaps for students who need to write an addendum because, you know, they've had something very personal in their life that has really detracted from their ability to perform, you know, to the level of um, academic performance that, you know, is typical of Georgetown students, uh, what would you advise them in terms of writing an addendum, but not making it sound perhaps, you know, an ex like an excuse? Right. I think that's right. I, I, I guess this is the differentiation between explanation and excuse. And I think it's just, if I want students, uh, look, when you're open and unafraid, that doesn't necessarily mean, only mean that you're just playing defense. I know this looks bad. Let me explain to you why this looks bad. That's great. I mean, I want to know that. Of course I do. But the most effective um, addenda and statements of, like this are the ones that sort of explain and then sort of turn it into a positive, turn it into a motivator, turn it into a future looking 
part of them, not just I didn't do well because this happened to me or happened to my family or happened to my best friend or something like that. I want to know that. And that's important as I sort of analyze the numbers. But because this is so much about the people, not just the numbers, I want to know everything about you and how that's going to sort of make you going forward, help you go forward to do really terrific things. So again, it's all just part of the getting to know you phase of this. It's all just part of me wanting to know, just tell me who the heck you are and what, what you, you know, how you, what you're looking, where you've been and where you're going. I guess mm -hmm. both those things are, are important too. Yeah. And, you know, I think you highlighted an element of growth in showing, you know, this was a, you know, not ideal scenario, but this is the positive that came out of it. Um, and so one of the things that I'd like um, you to touch on perhaps is the difference between how the admissions uh, committee, excuse me, might view an optional statement versus a diversity statement, statement, because, you know, Georgetown offers multiple opportunities for students to portray themselves. And I'm sure many students are wondering, you know, how do I intentionally make sure that I'm communicating what the admissions committee would like to know about me in these different statements? Um, I got to think about it because we, I don't sort of divvy it up that way. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a terrific question. I'm not saying it isn't. It just, for me, when I read these files, it's just the whole picture. And mm -hmm. you know what? It, 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 if it falls under category diversity statement and this one falls in a different category, that may be how it's sort of categorized as it comes to me. But I'm reading everything and getting a sense of you as a whole. So I think as long as an applicant um, is careful and, and purposed to, to sort of present themselves so that I really get to know you, I want to know the diversity piece, but whatever else you want, and I want to know that too, but I don't carve them up. It's sort of one, not mixture, but one gathering of all of these things. I read them all. It's like reading all the chapters of a book. E each of the chapters are part of the whole. And when I'm done, I've got a sense of the whole book. And I honestly, I can't remember whether it was chapter 17 or chapter six, chapter six. I just, this is how I feel. And that's how I feel when I read a file. It's just sort of, what does the whole look like? How do you, how do you come across all of those elements you said, Gabby, they are part of this. Of course they are. But just write what, what matters to you, write what you think will matter to us, do it openly, do it authentically. And that's all you can do. And then let us do our stuff and we'll see how all that fits in. But just, you know, don't be afraid. I want to know who you are. And I know I've said that like 12 times and it's because that's how important it is to us. No, and I think it's a wonderful reflection of, again, the authenticity that you pointed out that Georgetown is really looking for in their applicants. Um, so I, you know, I suppose a lot of students are wondering in your view as, you know, the Dean of Admissions, what makes an applicant an appealing prospect, whether it be certain skills or experiences and has that um, perhaps evolved at all through COVID? Um, boy, it's a hard one to answer. You kind of know it when you see it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, here's what I think. I, the most successful law students in my 200 years doing this, the most successful law students are the ones who really want to do this. The most successful law students are the one who can't wait to get here and can't wait to sort of, they, they ready to dive in. Likewise, not every time, but disproportionately, the number of least successful applicants are the ones who don't really want to go to law school. They're, they're just sort of doing it for a different reason. Now that's changed a lot. Most of our students now, back in the day, I don't know what else to do. I guess I'll go to law school. Well, law school got real expensive. It got real expensive. And so to spend all that kind of money to sort of fall back, no thanks. I'm not that nuts. I can fall back and not at 60 grand a year. I don't have to do that. So that's changed now. I think we're seeing more and more. But it, it if you can come across as someone who is, here's a word, again, overused word, but it matters to me, passion in what you're doing, that passion about passion about Georgetown would be nice, but passion about the law, passion about where it's going to take you. That matters to me. And I can sort of, again, I've done this long enough. I kind of, if you as the applicants can get that across, 
that's a real good place to be. Because as I said, the most, this is not just at law school or being lawyers. I think that's probably two of any, any job I can think of. Gabby, you look like you really like, love the heck out of doing this thing. And it comes across when you do. I, it's a little hard for me to contain my enthusiasm and energy for this job. I love this job 200 years later. It's a great job. I wake up, you know, who do I thank for getting me this job? It's great. And if you come across that way, I think that's when people as law students and as future lawyers, I'm, I'm on the lookout for that. It's, it's not make or break, true or false. It's not like that. But if you can get, a, get that across in the optional statements, get that, we do some interviewing. If you can get that across, um, that matters to me. You bet it does. And one of the reasons I think, I don't want to go too far afield here. One of the reasons why this year has been a year like no other, and that's an understatement with COVID. You mentioned COVID. Um, I, th I think people are watching what's going on in the world and realizing how law and lawyers are involved with just about everything. And suddenly now, not suddenly, but now comes the time for more and more people to say, that's what I want to do. I want to go do this. So I've met 2,600 applicants. We do interviews. I did group interviews. So I've met 2,600 of our 14,000 applicants. I've met them. I've talked to them as soon as like this. And you know what? It, it's the easy, lazy explanation for why applications are so high this year. Well, you know, the economy's lousy and blah, blah, blah. That's not what's going on here. People aren't falling into this. Again, it's too expensive to do that. People are ready. They're motivated. They want to do this. They're watching. They went through this election. They see what's going on in the streets. All of this, again, I'm not taking sides, although I have different sides. I'm not taking sides. But these are people who are, these students are motivated. When that comes across, man, I love that. I love it. It's exactly what we want. I think that's one reason why Georgetown has so many applications, 14,000 this year. We're up 40%. That's never happened. And, and that's to us anyway. It's the most because that energy, that's sort of, I want to be where it's going on. And when that can come across in an application, to get back to your original question, Gabby, when that can come across in an application, that's terrific. That's great stuff. Mm -hmm. No, certainly. And uh, one of the students in the chat actually mentioned their interest in immigration law and specifically immigration law clinics. But um, you know, this question isn't necessarily on behalf of that student, but I'll use them as an example. So a lot of students that you're mentioning, you know, they're realizing this year, law is something that I want to be part of. That's a career that I want to join. And so perhaps for students that know what direction per se they'd like to go towards, which is law, you know, whether it be immigration law, for an example, but don't necessarily know or can't articulate specifically what that career might look like for them. Um, what advice would you give to that student in conveying that passion uh, through the personal statement, but not for a student, I guess, who's not necessarily sure specifically how to get there? Yeah, and I, you know what, you've just described probably 60% of the applicant pool and they, they are, you're exactly right. And, and there are, we get lots and lots. I'm not, the passion doesn't necessarily have to be for the niche you want to do. I want to do criminal justice. Let me tell you why I want to do criminal justice. Let me tell you what I've done with, or immigration or whatever it is, human rights, whatever it is. Um, that's nice if you've done that, that's terrific. But if the passion is the law, tell me sort of in an uncliched way, there's this word authentic again, tell me an authentic way, what brought you to us? What brought you to me? How come? And if, if as you talk about this, it doesn't have to be, this is the thing I wanna study. People change their minds all the time. They decide later on, it's all good. That doesn't make any difference for us. But the passion can come across by just, I wanna do law. I'm not quite sure. I think I might want to do this. I, you know, just walk me through what brought you here and, you know, just animate it. Animate how you write. It's a nice word, I think. Animate in how you write, how you are. That, that's something that will catch people's attention and catch my attention. So I'm not worried about the specific, you know, you got to know what you kind of major in in law school. Law schools don't have majors and you'll change your mind anyway. But if you've been out for a while and you, you have experience in this, terrific. If you don't, that's just as terrific. It's all good. Wonderful. No, and you know, you keep bringing up authenticity and honesty, and I think that all plays into vulnerability too. But um, you know, if I may summarize this correctly for those who are listening, uh, don't be deterred by not knowing specifically how you're going to get to 
a career in law. Just be, you know, I guess, confident in your interest or passion towards a certain subject. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I would say it's if you put that in bright colors with three exclamation points, I'm on. I'm in. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Um, and, you know, another question that's perhaps not one that you're used to, I'm not sure, but um, is many students struggle, of course, of, with this when to go to law school. And I know that by the time, you know, they come to you, they've decided I want to apply at least. But in your perspective, for those, especially right now, who are considering entering the workforce for a few years prior to applying for law, um, what advice would you give to those students who are deciding right now whether they're ready for law school or, or maybe perhaps whether they should wait for law school, just given the current, current circumstances? I think this. I think... Um... Your mind's gonna change, you're gonna go back and forth. I think if you're not sure, wait. Mm -hmm. But I say that with one caveat. If, let's say we're in the next cycle, not the one we're in right now, but where you wanna begin in fall of 22, which I suspect most of the people listening to this, that's where they would fall. And you can't decide if you wanna begin in fall of 22 or 23 or 24, you're just not sure right now, you can't quite get a handle on it. My suggestion is, if you're genuinely conflicted, if you're not sure you want to wait, you think you might want to begin this fall, I would apply. I would apply, hopefully get in, and then defer your acceptance for a year and go do what you want to do. What I would be a little bit nervous about if I were an applicant, this is only if you're undecided. If you know you want to wait, apply and you know, wait and apply. Don't apply and wait. wait you know, apply, uh, wait and then apply. But if you're not sure, the world may look different to you in February or March than it does in August, let's say, as you're wrestling with this decision. I think um, to keep the options open, if you genuinely don't know, keep the options open, but only go when you're ready to go. Don't go before. You may not know that in August, but you'll know that in March or April of the spring right before. You'll know that then. If you apply, again, just, just talk about Georgetown. If you apply, you get in, will defer you if you're not ready to go, but you may be ready to go. It just doesn't look that way now, but it could change. That's the advice I'd give. I think only go when you're ready and only go when you can make it work financially, but mm -hmm. that's a huge part of this, obviously. But mm -hmm. if you're unsure, and if you think, you know what, I could wake up in April and I could be all psyched to go and I don't have anything else I wanna do. That's what I wanted to keep the option open. Most law schools, Schools will let you defer. We surely will. Maybe not for two, three, four years, one year, but it's good to keep your option open. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I'd like to get back a little bit to this COVID piece. And so could you speak um, perhaps to how Georgetown Law has navigated COVID-19 this year and how that's looked for students and what you expect to look, that to look like next year in 2021? You mean irrespective of admissions? You're talking about the school itself? The school itself, sure. And yes. perhaps you can also speak to the admissions piece yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, you don't have enough time for me to speak about admissions. I'll be going for about three days. It's been so interesting. So I'll try and be brief, which is hard for me, but I'll try. School-wide, school-wide. Um, I can't begin to count the number of Zooms I have been on with the administration at Georgetown Law School as we're trying to find our way through. First semester that we just went through, the one semester fall 20, um, that was all remote, like mm -hmm. most law schools were. And, you know, I think people managed, but it sucks. I mean, you know, who the heck wants to be remote? Sorry, but it wasn't very good. Sorry. Um, it wasn't very good is what I meant to say. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we got through, students learned, but that's not the way you want to do anything for Pete Six. This semester we're in right now, there's been a little bit of hybrid learning. There have been some small classes. You take a big classroom and you take one third or one fourth or one fifth of the population and you spread them out in the classroom. That's what's gone on so far. I think it hasn't been, no school has been terrific with this, but it's been pretty damn good. And I think students are antsy and miss all the things that I'm, everybody I'm looking at, everybody's listening to this misses. I misses the same, no difference uh, between law students. I think we've managed okay, but in the fall coming up now, the fall of 21, I am 
we are all so ready. Not, it, it's too simplistic to say, turn the page. We are so ready to sort of be able to say to students, we expect people to be in Washington. We expect that we will be, again, I'm not declaring this, but we expect that we will be in person. We expect you to be vaccinated and let's rock and roll. I think that's that right now is the plan. Everything's gonna move. You've got you know public health guidance, you've got the city of Washington, you've got the main university. But our our feeling right now is in our attitude is see in the fall. And I mean literally see in the fall and not over this thing, but see in person in the fall. That's our plan. And I expect that's what's gonna happen. We could get a set, setback or two, I don't know. On admissions. I should take a breath here. Sorry. Was there another? Can I just keep going? At Gabby? Oh, Is that okay? please keep going. Yes. Sure. Love the passion. Take more than the, we're going to take yeah. more than the 60 years to slow me down anyway. <laughs> so I, um, on admissions, it, it uh, I've never been through anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was how we finished last spring, this year's entering fall 20 class, and the year we're in right now. Mm -hmm. I remember when I left my office on March 10th or 12th, whatever it was. I remember when I left the office, I remember I got the staff together and we all knew we were gonna go home. We didn't know we were gonna be home for you know, 16 months for God's sakes, but we knew we were going home for a while. And I said to everybody there, how we treat and react and connect with applicants will determine how well we do. So memorize what I just said to you. I want every single admitted student, every single applicant, but particularly admitted students, remember we're in the spring now, we're dealing with admits, I want everybody to feel welcome and I want them to feel important. You can't do that in person. We're gonna figure it out. So we all got back, got in front of these damn screens and we did lots of Zooms. Every Monday, I sent a video to all of our admitted students. Every single Monday, Mondays with Dean Ambie. That's what it was, still is, to all our admits. Here's what's going on. Here's what we're thinking. Have you met my children? Here's this, what do you think about that? And that connectivity, Gabby and everybody listening was just critical. So that brought us to the finish line. We had a great year, we were all good. Now comes 2021, the year we're mm -hmm. in right now. Same principle holds, but now I've got the fall. And the fall is when we sort of reach out to applicants. No one's admitted right away. So it's about meeting and talking to and doing stuff like what we're doing now to applicants. Mm -hmm. I chose, we all chose to view this as an opportunity Zoom, like I say, is not a great thing, obviously, but it does allow me to reach out to people all over the world and never leave my dining room. And I thought to myself, sorry, I was going to use a bad word. The heck with, sorry, the heck with um, sort of, um, we're not going to reach out. The heck with that. No bloody way. So what we did was I reached out to all of these undergraduate schools and said, you know what? I'm ready to walk into these kids' living room. Put me in, coach. Let me talk. And so I wound up going to all 50 states, talked to a whole bunch of folks. That was grand. That was grand. Went to 50 states, several foreign countries or whatever. That was grand. Now came part two. Part two was once people applied, we do group interviews at Georgetown Law School. And by we, I mean me. We do group interviews. I used to meet with 10, no, I met with 10 people at a time in the big city. So I'd go up to New York. If you were an applicant and you lived in New York, we invited you to this law firm. I hung with you for an hour. We did something that I'm not gonna tell you. We did something and then I made notes and now you became more of a person to me than just a file. We did the exact same thing, but we did it this way. So I do groups of eight. I've met, as I said to you, I've met 2,600 applicants. I've done 350 of these, 350 of these with eight students, eight students each. I've been to six continents, I've been to 26 countries, 50 states, and I haven't left my dining room. It's been terrific, absolutely terrific. That's, that's how you gotta deal with this. And now we've got all the Zoom stuff. So I'm hoping that people will feel welcome at Georgetown and feel a part of this, but man, did that just get more important as time goes on because everyone's sort of isolated and, and behind these darn things, no hugs, no shaking hands for God's sakes. What's, it, what's life come to without hugs and handshakes or whatever? This is how you gotta do it. You gotta electronically hug people. You gotta make, you gotta be there for people and connect with them and make them feel like they matter. That's true any, any aspect of life.
but in the middle of COVID, it's never been more true. Mm -hmm. Now I'll take a breath, sorry. No, this is great, you know, and it continues on this theme of just how personal the application process is for Georgetown Law. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And one of the students um, in the chat was wanted to ask, how does the law school look at reapplying applicants? Um, law school is getting harder to get into, not easier to get into. So um, if you are essentially the same applicant, um, there's more chances than not that it's gonna be the same decision. But more chances than not can be 51%. That gives you 49% to change the decision. As when you reapply, and we've taken people who've reapplied, you bet. Indicate to us in your statement, walk us through a little bit about why, why we're seeing you again. Yeah, I wanna to come to Georgetown, just walk us through that narrative and, and give me some sense what's changed. Now, obviously one thing that changes a lot, people retake the test and they do better on that, whether it's the GRE or the, the LSAT. They take the test then that can be a plus for sure. Maybe we haven't talked about this yet, Maybe it's when they apply. Mm -hmm. The when you apply in this is a really underrated piece of the application process. Again, there's another question you haven't asked me that I'm gonna answer, but I hope that's okay. Um, there've been a series of those, I know. Um, we have rolling admissions. Rolling admissions, it's different than undergrad. Undergrad, letters are mailed out, most schools, twice a year. Mid-December, late March. That's it, one, two, twice. At Georgetown Law School, most law schools, but at our law school, we have rolling admissions. You apply, your application is complete. We make a decision, we let you know. We're not hanging out, we're not waiting for you. You're not waiting on us, we'll let you know. What that means is the sooner you apply, the better your chances. Just picture a Zoom where there are 25 squares and you'd love to be one of the 25. And you come to Gabby here who holds the key to the whole thing. They say, Gabby, I'd love to be one of your 25, please. And Gabby looks at her 25. And look, there's only one person on that 25. Gabby's got 24 squares. Huh. Well, Gabby's thinking, sure, I've got plenty of room. Come on. Same person, same Gabby, walks up to Gabby four months later. So Gabby, I'd love to be one of your 25. Gabby looks at her 25. Oops, 20 or 22 are already used up. It's the exact same applicant. Gabby's gonna be more careful now. Gabby may say, you are on a waiting list here. I don't know what else is coming or whatever. This is exactly how this works, except it's you know a Zoom of 14,000 people. But it's, this is how it works. You wanna get there when the fewer Zoom squares, I guess the rectangles, fewer Zoom rectangles are populated. That means, Notwithstanding that the recommended deadline at Georgetown is March 1, most schools it's February 1. Sure, that's good to know. But if I were you, those people listening, let your deadline be Thanksgiving. Let your deadline maybe even be Halloween. Get in the game. Get in the game. The interest in law school, I do not think is going to subside. I think it's here to stay for at least a while. Mm -hmm. Rolling admissions means get to us early. Let us know how eager you are to come. That can make the difference between a yes and a no. Yeah, no, and I hope that uh, many students listening feel your energy through this conversation and feel certainly more motivated to get their application in early. But, um, you know, from as, as an applicant, uh, this is from an applicant's perspective. Let's say you're an applicant and you're considering applying early, but you're not confident in your LSAT score. And this happens a lot. And you're looking to reapply. What would you? What advice would you give to a student who's considering waiting to submit their application until they have a higher LSAT score? I think that's a great question, and they all have been great questions. That's a particularly great question, and then there's a trade-off here for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure, there's the benefit of early versus the benefit of a higher test score. It's you've got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm gonna. No one's listening. It's just me and me. And I know I'm gonna do better. I feel it, I'm honest with myself, authentic, there's that word again, I'm honest with myself, I'm gonna do better. Then that applicant, if I were that applicant, what I would do is I would apply, let's say you're gonna take the test in November and you're debating whether to apply in October. If I were that applicant, I would apply in October 
and I would say to the admissions committee, to me, please hold my application for my November test scores. Mm -hmm. That way your application's in, you're in the game, but we're waiting and waiting. Here come your test scores. Okay, it's ready for me to read now. You could do that if you are waiting for your test scores to decide whether or not you're gonna to apply to Georgetown. Yes or no, am I gonna apply or not? Then I would wait for the score, obviously. But I wouldn't do that anyway, because I think we take people based on a whole bunch of stuff. But I would, for, for sure, if the, if the better test score will help your chances, make sure I know you want me to wait or wait to apply. That's okay. The difference between October and November is not what I'm talking about so much. I'm talking about the difference between October and February, the difference between early November and late January. That's when these things tend to come pouring in. And mm -hmm. sort of, if you got your seat at the table a little bit earlier, that's more advantageous for you. I have a question on the chat, um, just regarding that note. Do uh, applicants email admissions to let them know to hold their application? Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that. And yeah, I mean, I'm, in terms of rolling admissions, other than LSAT scores, are there any other trade-offs that come up often for you when you're speaking to students as to giving them advice as to when to apply or telling them to apply early? For the, in most cases, the early wins, uh, test mm -hmm. scores won, and for college seniors, that seventh semester, that fall semester of their senior year, if that's gonna be a terrific semester, and sort of cement the trend in the grades and all of those kind of things. Then again, that's another case where I would apply in early December and say, please hold for my for my you know seventh semester or first semester senior year grades. That can have an impact. We're happy to see that. Other than that, um, you know, maybe you're finishing an internship. Maybe you you'll be getting a letter of recommendation that you're not quite ready to get in October, but you will be ready to get December. Again, this is it's. Look, it's not hard and fast. There are cases where people might want to wait because I can send you this if I wait, but I can't send it to you if I don't wait. Then it's better to wait. That's absolutely fine. No problem at all. I'm just saying, my, my point is only if, if it's all the same to you, if it's just when you're going to get down and doing this, and when you're sort of going to get focused to, to turn the application, it's going to be the same applicant, same application in early November that it will be in early February. Early November wins. Okay. No, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I realize we're a bit early on time. So if there are any other questions in the chat, please. Oh, yes, there is. Um, does Georgetown offer housing stipends? We do not offer housing stipends. No, we don't. We have okay. scholarships and you can put that towards the housing, but we do not do specifically for housing. We do not. Wonderful. So because there's extra time then, um, Dean Andy, would you mind speaking to the scholarship opportunities that Georgetown offers and perhaps how the admissions committee um, evaluates applicants who maybe are uh, scholarship prospects? We are right in the middle of that. Thank you very much right now as we're doing. This is my break tonight. I get to hang with you guys. And when I'm done, unfortunately, I'm back to that. No, I like that. That's fine. Um, look, here's what happens. Um, once you are admitted, nothing happens financially. The decision is made irrespective of, of need, irrespective of your financial situation. It's completely need blind. I have no knowledge of it. And you know, maybe in a personal statement it comes across, it's of no consequence to me in terms of getting in, whether you can afford it or not. Once you are admitted, there's two scholarship routes to take or two scholarship routes that you can take if offered. One is need-based, one is merit-based. The need-based is done by our financial aid office. It is done sort of based on all sorts of aspects. I strongly suggest all of you sort of go online and you'll see it explains and talk to people there. That's a need-based thing that most applicants have a pretty good sense of. For the merit-based scholarship, once we have the pool sort of organized and almost done, and that's usually February, late January and February, I will look at that pool again and offer scholarships to um, particularly um, attractive applicants to us. It is not, not capital N, capital O, capital T, not strictly numbers based. It is not, you get scholarships if you're 175 and you don't get it if you're 171. 
No, 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 no. It's not like that. It basically becomes sort of another admissions process where I look at the total pool of admits now, not all applicants, but admits, and see those students who would provide so much to the school that we are prepared to offer them a merit scholarship to come. So there's the need base, there's the merit. The merits go out sort of an ongoing basis um, and people can, can ask us for it, we'll respond. But basically it's, we, we'll let you know whether we're gonna be offering you a scholarship. Now there's also, there's need based, there's merit based, and then you marry the two. And that those are our opportunity scholarships where those are our highest need admits. And those are the very best of those highest need. And we combine the two scholarships together. So believe me, I understand how important finances are in this. Believe me, I know that. And I know that there are plenty of kids, who are, sorry, plenty of people who would love to come to Georgetown, but we've got to make it affordable for them to come. I, I couldn't get that more. It's impossible to get that any more than I get that. And then it just becomes our ability to do so. We just, we don't have unlimited funds. I can't do that for everybody, but I can do that for a fair amount. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. Once you're admitted, I want you to come. What I say all the time to admitted students is once, I've, once you get that email that begins with that delicious word, congratulations, you're one of us now. You're a Hoya lawyer, that's who you are. And we consider you that from the day you're admitted. You won't all come, but man, we hope you will. And we're gonna make you all feel welcome and important. And part of the way you can do that is to make it financially feasible. We work hard at this. Believe me, Gabby, I know how important it is to everybody listening, the finances of this. Believe me, it ain't cheap. No one wants to borrow huge amounts. That's absolutely right. We'll do the very best we can to work with you. I can't make promises, except that I can promise, to work as carefully and as long as you want to make it possible for you to come to Georgetown. Because once I've said yes, we want you to come. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Because I know that you know financials are certainly top of mind for many students. Um, and so one of the other questions that I got was do you, in terms of you know speaking with admissions advisors or perhaps student amb ambassadors, <coughs> Um, how do you suggest that students go about doing that if they know they're interested in Georgetown law, but they're not necessarily um, sure what questions to ask or are nervous in talking to admissions advisors? Um, and if so, when is a good time to reach out for those conversations? I think in the first instance, the first suggestion I would have is to pay attention to when we do information sessions. So that's an easy not anonymous exactly, but a, sort of a way to sort of gather information. Unfortunately, it's like this. Hopefully at some point we'll be doing it in person. Go to info sessions and listen and learn all the things we have to talk about. Most of those info sessions are frankly about admissions. What do I look for in a personal statement? How much do you weigh the LSAT? How much do you weigh this? How much does this count? All of those things, because at that point in the fall, it's about getting in. Um, as time goes along, Again, every, anybody should feel free to send us an email. I, you know, we, we're so busy. I, 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 we just won't be able to get the one-on-one -on -one like you and I are doing or I'm doing with all of you guys. That won't be possible yet in the fall because we're trying to reach as many people as we can. But as the season goes on, particularly, you know, as the application season wears on, we, we will try and be as available as we can. We do it mainly by groups. When you've got an applicant pool our size, you've just got to do it that way. But as you know, January becomes February and December becomes January and February becomes March, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to do more and more of these, particularly for students who are waitlisted, students who are admitted. Those are students that we will do whatever we can. I, I can't promise all one-on-one, -on -one, but we'll have plenty of sessions. And any other questions, you should just email and feel very comfortable doing it. We're great with that, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. And you certainly um, have done a great job of really emphasizing, again, how personal this process is um, and how comfortable you guys try and make students throughout the application process. So I really appreciate that perspective. And in the last uh, few minutes here, if there's any other last minute burning, you know, recommendations or suggestions you have for students, personally, I'd love to hear them. I'm out of questions for tonight. Um, you know, I typically they come half an hour later. They just come flooding, unfortunately. But 
Um, or if there's any last minute questions on the chat, I'll watch out for that as well. But I'd just like to give you the last five minutes here. I'm gonna to say to, to the group that's listening and to anybody who'll be listening down the road, what I've had the pleasure of saying to a lot of our the students I've interviewed along the way. So I'm just gonna say this, this has got nothing to do with admissions, um, but you said I could Gabby, so I'm gonna do it. I'm going for it. Let me just say to everybody who's listening, everybody who's thinking about this thing, good for you to wanna to go be, to think about becoming a lawyer. Good for you. You don't need me to tell you that, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Good for you. Last 14 months, man, have we learned a lot. And what we've learned, as I mentioned before, is that law and lawyers are involved with just about everything that's going on in the world right now. That's why we need you to do this. We need you to come be ethical, commit to justice. You go to a great law school, hopefully like Georgetown, we'll coach you up, and then you go out into the world. And as you go out into the world, here's what I know. You're gonna do something that will matter something that will be important in the darkness and fog of COVID. It's incredibly easy to sort of, and the admissions process, it's incredibly easy to lose sight of what the heck you're doing here. And what you're doing is great stuff. Come the fall, all that fog, or at least most of it, trust me, will go away. And then you will be on your way. In a COVID world, just think how musical the words on your way sound how terrific and fabulous does that sound go do it for people who want to do this what i've said to our students i'm going to say to everybody listening now those of you who want to go do this it's as though each of you individually has decided that you you want to run into the burning building that's what you want to do you want to run into it not away into it except guess what folks we've learned there are about a thousand burning buildings there's lots of burning buildings that's why we need you don't get waylaid. Don't do it some other time. This is the time we need you to do this. Go do it. I'd be happy to read your applications. I'd be happy to say yes. And then you're on your way. But good for you to want to do it. Good for you. Thank you, Dean Andy. Some of the themes, you know, I came away with in this conversation was just, uh, you know, words that come to mind are genuine and passion and motivated. So um, thank you for giving us those takeaways and for your time and for sharing your perspective. It was certainly really valuable for me to hear all your insights. So yeah, I can't thank you enough personally and on behalf of the other students. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, as I'm available anytime. Um, let me know I can be helpful. And, and thank you all for listening. And thank you, Gabby and the staff for, for having me. I'm really appreciative of it. It's a great opportunity. I love this job. And, and, the, and each year we get a different pool and each year we get these terrific, terrific students. For those of you listening right now, I can't wait to read your application. You be sure and let me know if this is how we met for the first time and we'll become bros. You wait and see, we will. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Thanks so much. Bye now. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.